up, my friends? Warrior Poet Podcast. I apologize for the slight delinquency that's going to happen from time to time on the Warrior Poet Project. But we have something worth the wait today. Miss Christine Hassler. Welcome to the show, my friend. How are you? I'm so excited to be here on this like stormy Austin Yeah, weird, huh? It's nice. Yeah. Were you here for the storms like two days ago? I was in Houston. Uh It was really bad there. And then I had fly yesterday. And last night I drove in the really bad thunderstorm, like white knuckle. Yeah. About 30 minutes. (laughs) I was just like praying like, oh my God. Can these windshield wipers go faster? (laughs) Can they go faster? There's a flash flood warning. How do I know? I don't know. How do you spot a flash flood? I have no idea. And the flash flood warnings come on our phone like... Like, like a, an emergency like a, alert. Like a meteor is going to hit. It's like, it's like <laughs> you're going to die from meteor impact. I'm like, oh, no, flash flood warning in some fucking county that I'm not even in. Great. Thanks. Thanks for that blazing alert. It's awful. It just it's pierces through. Do not disturb. It doesn't even care. It's it, like, oh, nope. do not disturb on your phone. Fuck you. Fuck it's you. raining. Yep. yep. Like, yep. got it. It's raining. I can't. You think, don't think I can tell? It's lightning <laughs> and thunder outside. Update. Yeah. Thanks for the update. Yeah. 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 Anyway. Anyways, but we're here. But we're here. And it's just a light drizzle. Like fine Scottish weather? It, yes, it's good like curl up with a book. A book? <laughs> what a segue. Are you, you're such a professional. Oh, you're no, such a professional. Well, one of the reasons you're here besides you being a good friend of mine yeah. is that you just came out with a new book called Expectation Hangover. Yes. Something we've all dealt with. Oh, probably too we, much. And if we haven't, you're lying to yourself. Exactly. If you've never been disappointed, I don't know <laughs> what you're smoking. So I haven't got a chance to to fully read the book, but I dug in, mm-hmm. picked out a few pieces, okay. and I love the premise, you know, and, and the idea. So tell us a little bit about the book, and uh, sure, let's get into it. So really what it's about is about how to leverage disappointment. So I've, I've been in the personal transformation industry as an author and coach and speaker for 10 years, and there's so many inspirational stories of people who hit rock bottom and then go and change the world somehow. But there's very few that explain what happens in the middle. Like how do you go from being on your knees to running a company or making a huge difference or being happy or whatever it may be. And I've learned Self-pity, that- Self-pity, alcohol. Right, that's, right. That's, that's, in, that's, that's, that's in the that's first generally. part of the coping mechanisms that don't work, but that uh-huh. people we give a good try to, right? All those things, watching too much TV, over shopping, like going into a relationship we're not ready for, like all those kinds of coping strategies that we've all tried from time to time. So in working with people for so many years, I found that like there's this this window of opportunity and disappointment that if you milk it and if you really dive into your disappointment on the emotional, mental, behavioral, and spiritual level, there's incredible transformation that can happen. So instead of having to keep repeating the same expectation hangover over and over and over again, if you learn how to leverage it, then this transformational doorway opens that usually puts people more onto their purpose, more into their passion, and often connects them to a higher power if they haven't had that in the past. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that you know one of the large premises is, is not focusing on how disappointed you are in all of these right. things that are coming up. But as you say in the book, what am I learning from this? What am I learning from this? Exactly. Because the whole pity party, the victim thing doesn't work. No. And when bad stuff happens to us, we na- I mean, most people have the natural human reaction of like, oh, this sucks. And I, I talk about that in the book. Like we're going to have our human feelings and mm-hmm. feelings are sometimes things we avoid or we don't really know how to process. So we're going to have that part of you know, the grief period or the upset period or whatever, and that's natural. But we've got to get out of the place of this is happening to me. Yeah. Because all that does is it it takes away all of our kind of our inner wisdom. It puts us in a place of victim, like I said. And then we just sort of like wait for the universe to save us instead of taking self-responsibility and really diving in and saving ourselves, which mm-hmm. we're all here to do and learn. Yeah. One of the one of my favorite quotes, and and I have I've always had this as part of my ethos, and yeah. I've gotten it from a lot of Toltec teachings. Mm. And a quote from Castaneda is: "For the ordinary person, everything is a blessing or a curse. Yep. For the warrior, there are only challenges." I love that. Yeah, and so that to me is really embodies a lot of this. It's okay. What challenge is this? This isn't necess- inherently good or bad or disappointing yeah. or not. This is just a particular type of challenge. A great success can be a challenge. Absolutely. You know, there's not only, you know, even when you meet your expectations, there's oftentimes a hangover. Absolutely. You know, and you can talk to athletes about that or people who, you know, you win the World Series of Poker and that's been your dream for your whole life. You meet, you do it, and then you're like, 
shit. I don't <laughs> what do I do from here? Yeah. But again, it's this. It all has to do with these expectations, good or bad. They're just challenges and learning opportunities. And, that, and that's how we learn. As human beings, we learn through contrast. You know, mm-hmm. I know joy because I know sorrow. I know hot because I know cold. I know when it's raining because I know when it's sunny. Mm-hmm. And that's the other thing in, in a lot of the personal growth, you know, movement is that there's almost this expectation that we should just be happy and up and grateful all the time. And that's even an unrealistic expectation because mm-hmm. we all have those moments where it's not like that. But it's how we respond to those moments that really, I think, makes us the warrior. Yeah. Because you know, we can't, I mean, that's the thing the expectation hangovers teach us. We have no control. And we love control. I think we're all like <laughs> addicted to control. Sure. Of, like the who, what, when, where, and why things happen. But we, it's a total illusion. But we have total dominion over how we respond to right. things. Yeah, that's the real, that's the real secret. You know, people are always seeking control from any variety of ways. Yep. Even, you know, I've, I've gone pretty deep into the philosophy of religion and a lot of people propose that that's one of the greatest appeals of conventional religion is you believe that prayer can influence these random occurrences yeah. that are happening that are out of your control. Um, but really the only thing that's in, in our control is our reaction to these occurrences. Absolutely. I even talk about prayer in the book because I feel like prayer, people often use it as a last resort Mm -hmm. and pray for an outcome. Mm -hmm. And that's not the way the universe or God works. Whatever, call it God, universe, divine nature. I don't care what people call it. Just just call it something and have a relationship with it, you know? (laughs) Right, right. And, but, but we don't, it's not like putting an order in at a restaurant, you know? Like, please God, like bring this money to me or let this happen or whatever. Please put the bacon on on the turkey club (laughs) sandwich. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, if it worked like that, that'd be amazing. Right. But what I have found most useful for me when, when I pray is praying for help in, in responding to whatever's happening. Mm-hmm. Like, please help me stay in gratitude. Please mm-hmm. help me stay in peace. Please help me find my way. Give me the strength to find my way through this instead of praying for outcome because then we just end up with an expectation hangover from source and then people start to doubt their faith and start to question start to feel like they're being punished by the universe and the universe does not punish us yeah even the word pray is sometimes uh, ruffles some people's feathers you know because it has such a connotation to a system that you know while some people still subscribe other people have been really disenfranchised by so you know call it pray or call it setting an intention yeah you know either way you know what you're doing is basically aligning yourself to yeah. to a purpose and a way of thinking and a feeling and yeah. an idea and and that's incredibly important you know i mean one of the most important things you do before any medicine journey is mm-hmm. you know set the intent and mm-hmm. then you got to let it go too because yeah. if you keep that and you stick with that and the medicine takes you somewhere else you'll have another mini expectation hangover when it doesn't go that way mm-hmm. so set your intent and then let it go mm-hmm. and i think the the, the wisest you know, knowledge systems around really do a good job of that, you know, even from different rituals of the Mm -hmm. despacho down in Peru, where you put all your intentions up in a bundle and you carefully create it and then you burn that motherfucker. (laughs) You put it in the fire, gone, peace. I love that. And then the aboga shamans, you do another ritual where you put it all in these leaves and you're in a river and then you let the river take it all away. You know, so setting it and then releasing it. Releasing it. Right, because setting it get, gets us in the energy in terms of the essence of what we want, but mm-hmm. we can't control the form right. of how it happens. Right, so you got to let it go. God, it's, Be ready it's hard. For the next like, it is. Surrender is one of those like totally sexy spiritual words. It's like, oh, surrender, and it's so hard. It's so hard. Yeah, and there's that balance between surrender and not trying. Right, right, <laughs> like, like and resignation, like, right? I'm surrendering, so what? You, no, fucking get up, do something. <laughs> no, you're lazy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not surrender. <laughs> you're just not doing Go anything. Kick some ass. Exactly. <laughs> it's not going to happen for you. Right, exactly. I love, I love calling it proactive surrender. Yeah. You know, doing everything we can within our dominion, within our power, and then, and then letting it unfold. Yeah. But you know, you, the universe meets us, or source meets us at our place of action and intent. So, right, like intention is mm-hmm. part of it. But if we're not taking a step forward, we're not getting feedback and we're not kind of putting it out there to, to source that this is the direction that I'm going. Sure. You know? So it's like a, it's a collaborative experience. Yeah, I mean, it's you hear it all the time. It's the writer who's, oh, yeah, I'm going to be a famous writer. What are you writing now? Are you writing every day? No, nope. no, nope. just going to Starbucks. No, but, you know, I've. <laughs> I smoked a lot of weed and I've seen it in the <laughs> fucking stars, you know, or musicians or other people are like, are you playing gigs? You know, you're going to be a rock star. Are you fucking playing gigs? No, man, not playing gigs. But well, I got a vision board. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah, like you got to get up and do it. But I think yeah. the important thing with surrender is surrendering attachment because yep. at the root of attachment is fear. And any time that fear is involved, the universe is like, oh, you're scared of that. Oh, you really? Yeah, you're scared of that? Here's Let's see. More. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Let, let me rub your nose in it and yeah. see. Make sure you're not scared of it anymore. Yeah, right. Yeah. That, that's how we develop the courage to deal yeah. with the fear. And I think attachment, I love what you're saying about attachment because – you know, I talk about the secret sauce of pursuing our goals without an expectation hangover is high involvement and intention, but low attachment. Because I think where we get tripped up in attachment is we make the outcome, we make like our worth and our happiness and our value and our enoughness dependent on the result. Mm-hmm. So there's everything in life that happens and then there's a meaning we give to it. Mm-hmm. And I think that's where we suffer the most or empower ourselves the most by how we interpret what's going on. Right. Another issue that's on this kind of delicate balance is, you know, people think about releasing attachment and you think you won't care anymore. Well, yeah. if I'm not attached to the outcome, what's going to you know, drive me to do it? Well, the outcome should be attached to your deepest calling, your yes. passion. You know, your it should vision. be something yeah. you're fired up to do. Yeah. And you don't need an attachment. You don't need that fear. It doesn't make you who you are. It's just what it's what you're here to do. If you are a hammer, you know, your best design and your body's going to reverberate when it hits the nail and that's exactly what your best purpose is yeah, you know yeah. not attached to the outcome of that it's just doing that is is what you're here to do i love that you said passion can we talk about passion for a second yeah let's talk about okay it. so passion so do you, you know the original definition of the word passion uh no suffering passion of the christ right uh-huh. so the original root definition of the word passion is suffering and over time we've evolved the word passion to mean things we love and I think that's so insightful because it's like oftentimes our, the, our calling, our dharma, the thing that we're called to do comes from our suffering. So just like we've evolved the word passion, I think we evolve our experience of suffering into how we serve in the world. Mm-hmm. Like I don't know if this is true for you, but I, I know so much of what I'm compelled to do and called to do has come from what I've learned in my suffering. Mm-hmm. And that's what's made me passionate about it. There's a component of empathy that's kind of required yeah. you know, from that suffering, you yeah. know, and really feeling it. the numbness is the greatest enemy. You know, I mean, true suffering is it's cleansing of the mm-hmm. spirit almost, but it's mm-hmm. that placated suffering, you know, mm-hmm. and that resisted suffering that mm-hmm. becomes a problem. You know, like, oh, no, I, I can't get sick. I can't like yeah. this can't happen. I can't be sad, you know, and right. this kind of fighting of it. But really sinking deep into that is really cleansing. It can help develop that that deeper empathy. So you look at people not as what they can do for you, but see them. Yep. You know, and that's it's important. That's the greatest gift we give each other, right? Right. It's like really seeing each other. Yeah. Through the eyes of empathy rather than judgment or projection or mm-hmm. what can you do for me and yep. all those judgment, things. Judgment. Judgment. That's, that's, that's one of the really difficult ones too oh. because it, you know, I've seen it particularly during these medicine journeys, you mm-hmm. know, it, it makes you hyper aware of these certain circumstances. And I've seen people carry judgments into it. And I've just watched how even as I listen to them venting their own judgments, I'm actively processing like, wow, this wall is now building between me and that person just from listening to them, you know, yeah. talk about this other person. And I have to like tear that down brick by brick and oftentimes say like, hey, you know, I can't listen to you talk about this right now like we have to see beyond that right you know we have to see all of us are imperfect beings just trying to figure it out and do the best like see past that judgment and see inside that person yeah and then that's when you can really connect absolutely but it's in in everyday life not on these medicine journeys where you're a little numb and you're making quicker decisions and you're back in the normal world it's all too easy to even get caught in that trap yourself yeah you know. I think we have to become our own best observers, you know, mm-hmm. like there's because we can all like I can be here sitting with you and I can also kind of project my from my mind's eye and like watch us having this interaction. Right. Mm-hmm. So there's a there's a part of me that's like in my body and then there's, you know, I can observe it as well. And I think how we deal with judgment is we've got to be that observer. We've got to like watch ourselves when we judge and be like, oh, there I go. Yeah. Like forgive ourselves from doing it. Like, how can I open more? How can I open my heart more? How can I be present more? How can I see? Because I think the person we judge the harshest is often ourselves. Definitely. And then we just leak all that judgment on everybody <laughs> else. <laughs> it's like if we start with being just kind and accepting of ourselves, 
And acceptance doesn't mean we love everything, you know, and do these crazy affirmations about being the most awesome person in the world. But it's just like, well, I accept not, myself. Well, it's not delusion. But right. It's a, but it's a deeper it's love a and acceptance of, yeah. and forgiveness, like radical forgiveness. Radical. Of anything that, that we're carrying. And that opens the doorway for real self-love, which allows for, you know, love for others. Yeah. You know, and, that, and that's one of those connections that people don't think, oh, you love yourself? Oh, you're narcissistic. Oh, you know, you got a big ego. No, 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 no. Like you have to love yourself. Yeah. If you don't love yourself, you're not going to love anything. The only you're only able to love others and the world to the extent that you love yourself. So and that, true. And that deep love. It's so true, so true. That's been my biggest soul lesson: is really moving from that place of being so intensely hard on myself, like mm -hmm. harder than anyone possibly could be, which was confusing because it got me results in the external world. Mm -hmm. Like my harshness and my self-criticism led to a lot of success right. and led to a lot of people going, wow, look at like your amazing life. Like you've got it all together. <laughs> so look at how successful you are in this and that. And so I was like, oh, wow, this is really working externally. But internally, I was so depressed and medicated for it. I was constantly looking for the next best thing. I was numb. I wasn't connected to source at all. And there was never enough. Like mm -hmm. I'd achieve, like you said about the athletes, I'd achieve something and then it'd be like, well, what's next? Mm -hmm. So there's no peace, no contentment because there's no self-love. How'd you get out of that? Oh boy. Um, by doing a lot of what I write about, honestly, but it was, it was a journey. First, it was a choice. It was like realizing that what I was doing wasn't working and I had to lose everything to really get that lesson because in the past I could be pretty stubborn and pretty like convinced that I knew what I was doing. Mm -hmm. So in a period of a year, I lost my job, my finances, my fiance, my health, and was estranged from my family for a while. And um, Dark night of the soul. Very dark night. Yeah, very dark night of the soul, bathroom floor moment, do I want to be here anymore kind of mm -hmm. things. And that was the first time, like that, that depth of darkness was the first time I actually felt as an adult that I could remember the light. Like that, that night on my bathroom floor where I was thinking, do I want to be here? Something else came in. Well, I awoke to something that was already within. Mm -hmm. And the, the best way I can describe it is I felt this unconditional love inside of me. And it only lasted for a second because my brain came in and was like, what's happening? What's going on? What's, right. what's this? Just you a know? glimpse. Yeah, just a glimpse. But it was enough of a reference point to go, oh, that's what I've been chasing through all these you know, jobs or guys or money or whatever it may be. And... I made a promise that night that if I figured my way out, I would dedicate my life to helping other people. And that's really what got me on the path. But then it was it was years of unraveling and unlayering. I mean, just getting off of medication that I had been on from 10 until 30. Wow. So so 20 years of antidepressants and anti-anxiety. They like put all you on antidepressants at 10, at 10? At 10 years old. Yep. I don't think ten years old, ten year olds can be depressed. <laughs> I, think, I, I, exactly. I think they can just be a little bummed or something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was. You know, I think it was. Your parents do the best they can, and they just don't want to see you suffer. Yeah. And back then, doctors were God, so the yeah. doctor said this. And I get it. It was totally part of my journey, and and I'm really dedicated to helping other people get off of them because I mm -hmm. realized. I think we all develop ways to numb because life is, you know challenging you know we come into this world like just heart open totally connected to source these big balls of love and then shit happens and mm -hmm. like it gets harder you know and so we develop our ways that we numb and for me that was that was it but getting off of them especially after 20 years and especially after um you know being on them when my brain was forming was an intense journey you know yeah. i had to be willing to to not only deal with what came up emotionally, but change my whole like diet and body chemistry and like all of that. And and a big part of it was having a spiritual connection too. Mm -hmm. So going into that and digging through that and coming out the other side when I was told you will never be able to go off of these was um, liberating and totally a soul journey. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't doubt it. I mean, yeah. that's, uh, that's a real hero's journey there. Yeah. <laughs> and And... I'm so grateful too to have the comparison uh -huh. because life now is so different. Yeah. You know, it's just so different. It's just like um, I, I experienced the full range, which is so awesome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah tasting that, the, the broad spectrum, you know, that's kind of what the warrior poet principle right. is about is just 
allowing yourself to feel everything yeah you know, from the depths of sadness to the heights of ecstasy yeah you know that's part of the human experience right and not judging which one and saying oh i need to be only on this side of the spectrum always i gotta be warrior always i gotta be feeling good and charged up and ready for anything you know it's okay to experience the other side yeah you know and, and feel into that and um allow yourself right the breadth of this experience right because that's where we experience compassion right mm -hmm. which is i think one of the most beautiful qualities that we as humans experience is and again like that word passion's in there so it's in co so it's being with suffering yeah yeah. I always thought Passion of the Christ was like one of those quasi-sexual <laughs> moments where the Christ comes in and Sorry you have to like blow a, that image for you. <laughs> you have like this rapturous <laughs> orgasm, you know, like isn't like the ecstasy of St. Teresa. Oh, I love you that know, you like, thought about it that way. Oh, <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you can keep that reference. <laughs> well, you know, now it makes a little more sense, you know, expanding my knowledge of things. Good, good. Glad I could reframe that one. <laughs> uh -huh. Now I get it. So who should, you know, wh what are the type of people who should read uh, this, your latest book, Expectation Hangover? Um, anyone who wants to go deeper in their life in any way, anyone who's ever really been disappointed or you, f you feel like you're experiencing kind of the same disappointment over and over again, or if you're just like going through the motions of life. You know, I think that, that that's a, a big part of disappointment where nothing's really terribly wrong but nothing's really right either, mm -hmm. you know, so that's it. And then if you've got something, if you've got an expectation hangover that you can't seem to heal, uh, you know, when people would say to me, well, time heals all wounds, I'm like, how about I learn how to heal them? I don't right. want to really wait on time to heal time my wounds. Time just puts dirt over it. Exactly. You know, it doesn't oh, like, that's, so, that's doesn't such a like, good way to doesn't say it. fix it. It's like if you have a broken wall in an archaeological excavation, you know, yeah, dirt will come over it and you won't know that it's broken anymore because it'll be covered in shit. But but really, if you want to fix that wall and fix that structure, yeah, you got to dig back then underneath the dirt, go back there and fix it. And then when it, you know, when stuff happens, it'll go. That's for, okay, so this book is for people who don't want to throw dirt on their problems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Perfect. I love it. <laughs> I like that. I like that. And so what other, what I know you've also, you know, you lead particularly women's retreats uh -huh. around the world. Yeah. What have you seen as far as, and, you know, the different dynamics and needs between men and women and mm. how this society is formed? You know, how do you approach those? Because obviously you're selecting just running women's retreats at this point. And right. you've probably also done some mixed retreats, I'm sure. But, yep. but what is it specifically about the needs of women that, that you can pass on to our listeners here? Well, I think women are in a really interesting time um, because the paradigms in the world are really changing. So we're seeing a huge deconstruction of the masculine paradigm out in the world. We see it in corporate America. We see it in the banking. We see it in government. Like the kind of old way of doing things, that very kind of almost shadow side of the masculine is breaking down. Mm -hmm. So more and more women are actually being kind of called forward to come into their power. But before we can really come into our power, our feminine power, not kind of the feminist power that was more like how do we compete with men and be like men, mm -hmm. but come into our true feminine power, the power of receptivity, the power of creativity, nurturing, all of those kind of amazing feminine qualities, we have to go through our shadow, right? So I think a lot of women are starting to kind of feel that upheaval inside of them of you know, either nothing feels wrong, but nothing feels right, or my life isn't turning out like I've expected, or more and more women are, are dealing with issues of abuse and like finally having a different relationship to rape, molestation, all of those kind of more heavy issues. So that's what I see really happening for women is this opening to come into our feminine power in a, in a different way with, with no againstness mm -hmm. towards the masculine at all. Right. No judgment. No, we want to be like men or have to compete with men. But what does feminine power really look like? What is the sacred feminine? Exactly. You know, and I think that's, I mean, there was probably quite a bit of damage done by the feminist movement yep. in saying, we're all the same. We're the same. 
Really? No. Is that the way we want it to be? No, <laughs> Is that the way please, it should no. Be? You know? No. Every every time I board an airplane and no one helps me lift my suitcase over <laughs> the thing, I'm like, come on, guys, help me out here. And they're like, oh, sorry, we didn't know. I'm like, no, really, I like help. <laughs> um, and I see women refuse help, and I'm just like, what's wrong with you? You're ruining it for the rest of us. Yeah. But but I think the feminist movement, you know, to me, the, the best thing about the feminist movement, it was about choices. It was about, hey, ladies, like, if you want to go and work, great. If you want to be a stay-at-home mom, sure. great. And that's that's the beauty of it. But where it got misinterpreted, I think, is in this, like, we have to be the same. And I like gender roles. I like the masculine-feminine dance. I mean, if you don't have polarity in a relationship, you're going to, in five years, you're going to end up like roommates or cheating on each other or something. Like, you need that that dance. Mm-hmm. And I think that's that's what's so important to the way our world works as well. So, it's yeah, it's not about being the same. It's yeah. about honoring our differences. A great book that I know both of us have read yes. is David Dieta's Way of the Superior Man. Such a good and book. And if you want to get a, a good idea of what these roles, these archetypes, you know, can be, the sacred masculine, the sacred feminine, yeah. and then the shadow sides of each and, and how that dynamic works successfully in a relationship. Yeah. It's a great book. It's a great book. And his book, Intimate Communion, is great too because mm-hmm. that talks about stage one, two, three woman, stage one, two, three man, and stage one, two, three relationship in terms of evolving into the masculine and feminine. Nice. Super I'm cool. To, I'm going to have to check that it's one out. It's a good one. Yeah. So in your in your retreats, yep. what are you what are you really working on specifically? You know, trying to bring out that sacred feminine quality yeah. or Well, first it's 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 going into the rabbit hole. So the first thing I do on any of my retreats is really um, a vulnerability circle, like a, almost like an exposing circle where the containers created, a safe space is created where people can really feel seen. Mm-hmm. Because we all have these protective masks on and we all know that vulnerability, where, you know, vulnerability has become trendy. Brene Brown's really, you know, brought it into the world. So we, we talk about it, but true vulnerability is is really exposing parts of us that, that we normally keep in the dark, that we normally keep hidden, that we may be ashamed of. So it's creating a container for women to be able to talk about those things, be able to process those things, to be witnessed. Mm-hmm. Because we're, we're, we're here together, right? We can't heal everything on our own. And there's tremendous healing that happens with, with going into something that's so vulnerable or, or so shameful or letting yourself have an emotion and be witnessed. And when I'm, when I'm in the retreats, what I tell the people that are holding space is the worst thing you can do when you're with someone who's sharing something is go into sympathy is go into any kind of, oh, it's so bad that happened to that person or it's so awful because that's judgment. Mm -hmm. It kind of seems like we're being empathetic, but we're not. It's still judgment. So it's creating that space where we're we're seeing someone, we're holding space for them, but we're not identifying them with their issue or problem. Right. And just that alone starts to create a healing. And it's like these layers of shame and anger and sadness that women sit on that keeps us from our passion, our creativity, and our, our juice, and our, our sacred feminine. Mm-hmm. And, you know, another thing I facilitate, and I've actually had the cops call on me twice, is... <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I, know. I like the sound I know. of this. This retreat's it was, getting it's getting better. They're, they're pretty good retreats. Is I, I facilitate anger burns for women because women really aren't given resources to let our anger out. So mm-hmm. we just get bitchy and irritable and judgy and controlling. And like, what dude wants that? You know, <laughs> like, oh, yeah, let me get a bitchy woman. That sounds awesome. <laughs> but it's because we have this anger that we don't process. And it's also why a lot of women don't know what their pers- their passion or purpose is because mm-hmm. they haven't let that anger and sadness out. So creating a space to do that. You mean, so you're actually burning stuff? No, well, you're burning the... the um, Metaphorically burning. But, uh, they actually do burn something at the end, but it's it's actually a release where I give women like little weapons, like this, you know, you know those weapons, little weapons, fire. Yeah, yeah. The <laughs> weapons right. fire. The so <laughs> weapons are, you know, those swim noodles. Oh yeah. Those foam things. Uh-huh. I cut them in half, and they're like they make for very good bats that you can hit stuff with and hit pillows with. And I facilitate this. I I, I bring in the warrior woman archetype. Right. And we do sage and this, there's this whole ritual and then they go into battle, you know, and I have them connect to a picture of their little girl before they do it. Uh-huh. So it's like you're doing this for her. You're doing that this lioness, for all women. That, that lioness, lioness. Yeah, that mama bear kind of. And they, they go in this room and it just is like this crazy yell, scream, hit, cry, punch, kick, do whatever you need to do. It's all set up for that. And it's like liberal. Women like look different. They lose 10 pounds in two days. You know, it, it's it's this incredible release. And then it's they're they're more connected to their heart because mm-hmm. all that is 
released. Yeah, they've expelled it. Yeah. They've excavated yeah. some of that armor. Yeah. Taken the layers off. Yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. You know, I, I think, and then looking at, um, looking at men's issues you know there may be some men that have that but men are generally at least that aspect mm -hmm. you know there's way more outlets yep. you know contact sports really kind of aggressive behavior is mm -hmm. is lauded so on the but on the flip side of that any kind of sensitive behavior is shamed yeah you know so for men the experience you know it just seems to me that that same liberation might come from you know deeper vulnerability yeah and just trying not to be tough for once you know right. like hey i'm not tough today <laughs> which is <laughs> so know? which is is also so masculine like right. it's it's i think you know in talking to women we don't want the man to be all the time you know well, it's we want to feel it's usually hard. based in insecurity yeah you know i mean i see somebody with a who's obviously taking a bunch of steroids and they're shaving their chest and they're got spiky it's hair totally my and, type yeah. how'd you know <laughs> and it's just like like man like i know deep down that you're suffering a little yeah. bit and you don't feel confident enough yeah in, in who you are yeah and you know some deeper you know searching maybe maybe the, the occasionally some that is just an expression of what they want but right. you know when you're just so focused on this physical appearance of really it generally means in the, in the guys that i've known that inside some inner confidence is really lacking yeah. it's interesting that you're saying that i'm just like so i fly a lot mm -hmm. and so i'm upgraded a lot mm -hmm. so i'm usually sitting next to some business guy and um i've had so many conversations on airplanes of men just pouring out their soul especially after like one vodka tonic it just like starts <laughs> to come out and and just like telling confessing cheating and how guilty they feel about that or feeling can talking about how they work so much and they've achieved this status and they still don't feel like enough and and like you said it's all from insecurity and i just listen and every single one of them at the end of the flight has been like you're so you're so great to talk to like you're you have such a great conversationalist and i'm like i haven't said a word like i've really just sat and like listened and i've really learned and it's been so valuable for me to to see men like that yeah. and to know that like men just need to be heard as well you know yeah for sure you know i was uh i was up in in new york and i went and stopped by an old family friend who's having a a big party and tons of wealthy individuals mm -hmm. you know billionaires that were there and i was particularly in tune that day for whatever reason i don't know it kind of goes up and up and down um, but i didn't really have many people to talk to there because mm -hmm. it's uh, you know kind of an old connection and there's a bunch of people there and looking at these kind of billionaire men yeah you could see that they were you know they were hurting yeah you know they had all the money in the world but no one who really would just get in there and love them mm -hmm. you know like give them a hug mm -hmm. rub their back without wanting anything in there and mm -hmm. just say hey you not not your money not this thing you've created this empire that you're sitting on top of the crown you wear none of that like you like we yeah. love you you know yeah. and you should love you too yeah <laughs> and you're then, enough just for who yeah, you are exactly mm -hmm. and you could see that and is it's it's one of those things like you think oh yeah you get to be a billionaire you get there you know pff, you got it fucking made that in itself is it a great great challenge like all of these things you know expectations of things that are bad you know bad mm -hmm. you know like you lose everything or you gain everything both are just equal challenges yeah you know and not one inherently is better than the other necessarily they're just challenges that have different sets of things you got to deal with so how do you because you run a very successful business and have a full life so how do you navigate expectations <laughs> i i actively work to release attachments yeah you know i think that's that's key and it's kind of like playing whack-a-mole you know like that carnival game where yep. they just I, pop I up and, bang, 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 yeah. bang, bang. and sometimes you know sometimes i'm just overwhelmed and i you know the moles <laughs> attack and they win <laughs> you know and sometimes i'm able to bat them down i mean i use the medicine journeys a lot to help yeah. me out with that um but just separating myself from from all of this so that mm -hmm. i'm not aubrey ceo of on it i'm just aubrey and aubrey's going to be okay no matter what happens you know if aubrey it's then it's not aubrey the the strong who can take down any workout you know because maybe that'll go too mm -hmm. you know and i might get injured or i might be sick for a little while or whatever like all of these expectations and and attachments that i have to things that make me up i just got to kind of cut them 
cut them off, cut them off. And that's all, it's a hard thing to do because people see you through these lenses, you know, Mm -hmm. constantly I'm being perceived as Aubrey CEO of on it or Aubrey, you know, in any, this, this athletic capacity or Aubrey in this, whatever capacity that I'm, that I'm showing, but more rarely in my scene is just Aubrey, this, you know, monkey trying to figure it out and, you know, do what he can. (laughs) So, so that's the, that's the hardest part. Just knowing that, Hey, if it all goes away, Mm -hmm. I'm all right. You know, hopefully I'll get to keep my, I have a nice wood pen. Get to keep this wood pen and be, be it'd be really dark day, be a dark days if I hadn't, didn't have my wood pen yeah. and my flute yeah. and like a few things and I'd be fine, you know, mm. something to write it, something to write on and I'd be all right, mm-hmm. you know, and, and that's, and that's okay. And I think that's, that's the key, but it, it's fucking hard. It's, it's constant awareness right. and work because it's easy to be seduced or sucked into all that stuff and especially when people have lots of expectations of you Mm -hmm. and project a lot of you know ways they think you should be or show up or whatever i think that that's one of the i can imagine that's one of the challenging things in being in the position that you're in expectations and dependencies too i mean that's the that's the hard part i think you know i hear from a lot of fathers and Mm -hmm. you know they're saying man i'd love to you know change my career and do something i'm really unhappy but man i got these two kids right you know, and, and that's, it's always a tougher, you know, it's a tougher piece of advice to give because you can't say, you know, it's not as easy to just say, Hey man, don't worry about it. Just follow your dreams. It'll work out. Cause I'll tell, I'll tell that to anybody who doesn't have like kids or like dependents, you know, it's just like, mm-hmm. don't just fucking go. What are you not going to eat? Someone will feed you. You'll, you'll have a couch somewhere, you know, like you got really nothing to lose. Everything yeah. you think you got to lose is there. But when you do, when you are supporting a family or supporting employees or supporting that, it's a real factor, you know, and then you have to kind of weigh that into consideration. You can't, and maybe you can, but you, you have to just know that there's there's more that's in that in that yeah. decision. Yeah. Well, and then there's also the, like, what are we teaching them? Like, if we're staying in safety, security, those kinds <laughs> right? of things, you know, not going after our dreams, then what what messages are we relaying? to True. the people that are watching us you know so it's it's a dance it is yeah i mean it's uh it's a challenging thing but i i think like if you got if you don't have i think it really it's really kids you mm-hmm. know if you don't have kids that you have to worry about putting food on the table you'll probably be able to put food on the table if you follow your passion because you'll probably make more money doing that anyways yep. most likely yeah but at least you have to be sensitive like you can't you know being or making money as a writer is going to take a year, two yeah. years, three years. So if you're like passionate to be a writer and you got a job as an accountant and that's what's feeding your kids, yeah. you, know, you can't necessarily just say, fuck it, I'm not an accountant anymore. Right. I'm a writer. We're going right. to figure this out. You know, you got to write in your spare time. You got to, you know, put your dedication into that and maybe make some decisions. But if you don't have those immediate dependents, yeah. fucking do it. Yeah. Just do it. You'll figure it out. Anything, oh, that the place you live in, the clothes you wear, all of these other illusions that we put right. on, forget it. Just They're go just for attachments. It. Just yeah. attachments. Yeah. It's nonsense. And that, like, I always tell people, if I waited till I wasn't scared before I did something, I wouldn't do 99% of the things that I do in life. Mm-hmm. No, I'm still scared or nervous or unsure or take these leaps of faith that I don't know what's going to happen. And I think that that's, that's how we develop courage. And that's how we're truly a warrior. And even in those situations, like the dad who's an accountant, if you can even be a warrior in that and be like, I'm going to accept this accountant job and be so grateful for it and not have a, I'm just doing this to stay safe and provide, mm-hmm. not have a, we have to reframe what we choose to accept in our life, mm-hmm. you know, and rather than just, I'm sludging this out because then you, that's what you're teaching your kids. Just suffer for safety yeah. versus be grateful for what you have and the support you have. Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, in an ideal situation, there'd be enough of a, kind of a tribe a community that could support these you know these things and yeah. so that you'd have more resources to pull from you know but in our nuclear family arrangement you know there is so much stress put on it's put on you know you to provide directly for that family yeah you know whereas in a probably a more ideal situation the basket is bigger yep. which would allow more creativity and oh, well, I can explore this a little while because there's enough resources that the tribe has accumulated that I don't need to pull the weight and just bite mm-hmm. down on the on the bridle and charge ahead and pull the wagon right. you know, for a little while. 
Right. So, you know, creating situations like that is it's definitely even possible now. I know. I hope someday we get back to more of that kind of living, that yeah, tribe and too. village and me too. community. You know, it just makes such a difference. We're too isolated. Mm-hmm. I think that's another reason so many people have these expectation hangovers. You just, we think we have to do it all on our own mm-hmm. and we're all alone and it's up to us. And whew, loneliness is brutal. That feeling of loneliness, especially being with a group of people and still feeling lonely and feeling unsupported. So I yeah. think that's important for all of us to like create our community and be active in that and nurture that, not just work so hard on our bodies or our jobs or whatever, but what's your what's your tribe? What's your soul family yeah. like that you're creating? Yeah. Well. Are we done already? We're done. Wow, that was so fast. I know. We could talk for hours and we should. Yeah. We'll have to do this regularly. Okay. Yeah, you'll be back to Austin, I'm sure. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Christine, thank you so much for coming by. Aww. Where can people find your book? They can go to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, my website, Christine Hassler. Books, go to a bookstore. I don't know. People go to bookstores yeah. anymore. It's in bookstores. Bookstore. What's so, that? I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> it kind of came out of a thing called a library, I think, a while ago. What? Wait. I know. Say that, I know. Say that think, I'll, I'll fill you in later. <laughs> okay. All right. Tell me off air. <laughs> okay. You can explain what that deal, all is. Deal, deal, And how about you so on social media personally and everything? Just my name, Christine Hassler, Instagram, Twitter, all those fun places. Mm-hmm. And it's two S's. Two not, S's. Not like someone who hassles. Not like someone who hassles, right. Hassler. <laughs> two S's. Nice German name. <laughs> Hassler. <laughs> Hassler. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for Real having pleasure. me. This is great. All right, people. I'm off to Peru, maybe. Um, yes, probably. But I'm still debating this decision. Uh, so, But either way, I probably won't see you for a couple of weeks. So much love in the absence. Peace. <laughs>